we're going to turn to chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 5 through 16. So John 16, uh, 5 through 16. Uh, John 16 and verses 5 through 16. Yes, I know. There's too many 16s. Throw you. I don't know what that's like, Dan. You're way older than me. Well, that's like a fine wine. That's right. I'm not here to talk about a young one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's no good, you know? Yeah. It's like, you know, old pizza and... Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, John 16, starting in verse 5, it says, But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts and taken complete possession of them. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to you to be in close fellowship with you. And he, and he when he comes, will convict the world about the guilt of sin and the need for a Savior and about righteousness and about judgment, about sin and the true nature of it, because they do not believe in me and my message about righteousness, personal integrity, and godly character, because I am going to my Father, and you will no longer see me. About judgment, the certainty of it, because the ruler of this world, Satan, has been judged and condemned. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear to hear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, full of complete truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but he will speak whatever he hears from the Father, the message regarding the Son, and he will disclose to you what is to come in the future. He will glorify and honor me because he, the Holy Spirit, will take from what is mine and he will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Because of this, I said that he, the Spirit, will take from what is mine and will reveal it to you. A little while and you will no longer see me, and again a little while and you will see me. And so it is with the believer in Jesus Christ. And I like so many things in there um, that he talks about that is really a gift to us as believers. And if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, if you haven't accepted him as your Savior, you're missing out on one of the most precious gifts we can have on this earth, and that is the Holy Spirit. Because not only does he guide us and lead us, but he comes to live inside of us. And that makes all the difference in the world. But one of the biggest plagues that we see today, and we see it in a lot of older people, speaking of older men, um, we see in a lot of older people is loneliness. And a lot of people suffer from loneliness. But not just the older people, a lot of the younger people now are dealing with loneliness. And there's reports and studies that say that it's gotten worse since the lockdown. You know, that people have been more isolated. And um, so there's studies that say that up to 50% of people suffer serious, Ill, uh, serious loneliness. And it's funny because we've become such a, a more connected society with social media, but in the process of being, becoming more electronically connected, we've become more isolated and lonely. And so something's just not right. A matter of fact, that social media has made things a lot worse. And I think it's alienated some people and it's divided in ways that we've never seen before. So there's a serious loneliness going on. Loneliness has been related to an increase of death by 26%. And you know, 95% of statistics are made up on the spot. So, 20, oh, I'm just kidding. But, uh, that used to be a joke from Stephen Wright years ago. But, you know, I always wonder, where do they get all these statistics, you know? But, uh, but they're saying, they, whoever they are, saying that uh, loneliness has been related to death, an increase in death by 26%. They say it is, loneliness is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That it, it wears on you. It's worse than obesity. It's associated with an increase in coronary artery disease and stroke. Loneliness can increase high blood pressure. It's associated with severe depression. And it puts people at greater risk for a cognitive decline in dementia. And so these are all statistics I looked up. But 
they're gathered by people who have never factored in being rooted and grounded in God's Word. So that's where those statistics come from. Because what has changed in my mind is the cause of some of this loneliness has also been coupled with a, de- a, a, a detachment from the truth of the Word of God and the Word of God itself. And I think society has removed this from all facets of life. It's never factored into a, a reason why that we as a society are suffering such loneliness. But in my mind, it, it stems from that. Um, they have removed God's presence from their lives. And it is His presence that sustain us, sustains us and gives us true companionship. I remember years ago... Um, visiting older people. And when I visited older people back then, the one thing that I always weaned from the fact of of being able to see those older people was the peace and the stability they had in the lack of companionship. A lot of them were widows or widowers. And yet, even the fact that they were that lonely and they lived alone, they weren't suffering from the same loneliness that another person was, was suffering from that we see today. And I, I asked myself, why? why? What's the difference? And the difference is, is they were rooted and grounded in the Word of God and they knew the companionship they had in the Holy Spirit. And today, society has lost the understanding and I think the church has lost the understanding of just who the Holy Spirit is and how He can be your constant companion and you never have to be alone. You know, He's there for us. And people need companionship. We all need companionship, but we have misunderstood how God comes in and becomes our constant companion. Some people have never been fulfilled by the one who has meant to fulfill them with his presence. He wants to, God wants to be our constant companion. And we need to understand who he is, understand what his intentions are, and understand how we can wait upon him. We can spend time with Him. We can be reinvigorated by Him. And we can receive of Him the fellowship that He desires for us to have. Many times we find ourselves in such a dilemma in our lives where there's a warfare going on, where we feel even as a family lonely. We feel like we have been forsaken. We feel like there's so much going on and it's so busy and there's no time and we're confused. And Anybody ever have that happen to them when they're going through something and it seems like you're so busy that you don't have time just to stop. And things seem so confusing. But when we force ourselves to stop and we say, God, all this is going on, and it's not that we don't have time to, we have time to pray or we don't have time to pray, it's that we have to pray. We've got to find the time to pray. We've got to make the time. And when we go make the time and we spend time before God in, in silence and quietness, we find that there's a, an abundant supply that reinvigorates us, that comes into us, that gives us a power that we didn't, ever have ourselves. The problem is we disconnect ourselves from that time of prayer. We disconnect ourselves from that time of seeking God. Remember in the old days when they used to have services. And before the services, they would spend hours in prayer getting ready for the service. And the, 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 the time in prayer wasn't so much for them just to spend time with God. All that's a benefit and a byproduct of being able to spend time with God is just that fellowship. But it was God, I want you to do something in someone else's life. It was, I'm preparing for this service because, Lord, you have to act supernaturally to save people from death. You have to act supernaturally to redeem someone's soul because it's nothing that we can do. But God and his resources makes way for it because he's the one who's full of all resource. And sometimes we don't tap into the resource that's there for us because we become too busy. Or our prayers have become you know, two-minute prayers, three-minute prayers, and I'm out the door. What happened to three-hour prayers, four-hour prayers? when you were reinvigorated, where you were resupplied by the very presence of God because you waited on Him. And that's what we need. That's the companionship that we need. But we've lost that as a society. We've lost that as a church. And we've lost God's presence as a byproduct of that. We always have God's presence. But we need to seek and spend time with Him and, and, and cultivate that presence, cultivate that relationship. So there's a couple of things that the Holy Spirit wants to do with us, for us, whatever you want to call it. And the first thing he wants to do, and I think we miss out on this so much, but God desires, the Holy Spirit desires to bring us comfort. And his companionship, he wants to bring us comfort. He wants to comfort us. And uh, 
he's in the process of comforting us and he's in the process of changing our lives in the process. But those are the two points I want to make this morning. That he wants to comfort us, but he wants to change our lives in the process. And they should go hand in hand together. Because so many times we think, God, you want to change me and it hurts and it's painful. But we leave out the fact that he wants to comfort us in the process of changing us. But they go hand in hand. John 16, 7, it says this. It says, but I tell you the truth... It is to your advantage that I go away, Jesus speaking. For if I do not go away, the helper, and I love the names, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to you to be in close fellowship with you. And that was the intention. I know years ago, Nicole was involved in... uh, counseling and court proceedings and uh, she was assigned to be an advocate for ch- uh, children, small children. And her being an advocate meant that she was standing in, the, in a gap for them, that she was standing before them as a representative to defend them and protect them before the court. And many of you can think of the Holy Spirit like that, that he stands in your stead to protect you, to keep you, to be your defender. And uh, that's one of his jobs, that's his function because when, when Jesus left the earth, and many people say, well, I wish I could just see Jesus. I wish I could see him face to face. And I do too. I think about that all the time. I think I can't wait to get to heaven and I'm going to see Jesus face to face and, and I'm going to run up to him and give him a hug and, and just for the first time ever be able to see him and see what his characteristics are like. And I think that, but he, he didn't leave the earth and, and, and leave us defenseless, leave us with nothing, but he sent the Holy Spirit as a helper in his stead to say, I'm not leaving you defenseless. That there will be one that defends you. And so when we go through the earth, we're not left in situations, although we, we think we are, left in situations where we're defenseless, where we're in this alone. And many times that's what you feel like when you get in the middle of a situation that you're in it alone. But God has assigned the helper to come and to be your advocate in the middle of the season that you're going through in the battle that you're facing. You are not alone. And we need to understand that when we go through things, we don't wage war on our own, but God has promised not to, uh, to leave us to not leave us comfortless. He's de- he decided that He Himself would come and comfort us and be a companion unto us. You know, and, and the greatest example of a companion in the Bible is, is Abraham. You know, and Abraham leaves a home and a house that is completely devoid of the true God, and God calls him by name. And not only does He call him by name, but He walks with him wherever He goes, and He leads him into a land and into a promise that still blesses us to this day. Because it was through, Jesus, or through him that Jesus was born. It was through his seed. But he also blessed Abraham uh, as he led him along the path. But he kept him every step of the way. But Abraham also stayed with God. He stayed close to him because he knew that he was his constant companion. But he doesn't leave us alone either. You know, the problem that happens a lot of the time today is that we have this comforter, we have this, this guide, we have this advocate, we have the comforter, but we refuse to be comforted. And we, we think in our own strength that we can overcome and accomplish what we have to accomplish, but you can never accomplish God's goal without God's way. So we have to understand who our comforter is, that we have this comforter and not refuse to be comforted, but go to a place of solace where we can be cared for and comforted. In the Bible, you know, names were such a big thing. You know, when my kids were born, uh, we prayed about the names. And we we got one of those, but everybody gets those baby books. They're like this big and, you know, you're flipping through them. And there's so many names in there. It's unbelievable how many names they've come up with, you know. And and we'd be driving by streets, you know. I remember we drive to Ellsworth and what, you, you know where Jenkins Beach is? There. And I thought, you know, Jenkins, that's a good name, man. Jenkins Thomas. You know, I mean, we'd, we'd, we'd pick names out of everywhere. You know, Dunkin' Donuts. I think Dunkin' would be great. And, you know, you come up with all these names, you know. And, and this book had thousands and thousands of names. And we would pour through that book and we'd list some names. And we, I can't tell you all the names we had in lists, you know, that oh, here's the girls' names, here's the boys' names, and, and I think I'll name this one that, and, and uh, he, he's turned upside down, so I might name him, you know, sideways, and I'll name him. You know, and you think of all this stuff, you know, as you're looking at three babies in one belly. And after looking at all those names, we prayed. And we thought, Lord, we want you to name these kids. 
And I kid you not, I wrote down names, and Nicole didn't know what I wrote down. And she wrote down names, and we came up with the same names after we prayed. And it was Benjamin, Elizabeth, and Elijah. Wow. And they each had a, a, a special connotation to who they were, and we had no idea. We had baby A, baby B, and baby C. That's all we knew. But we named them based on what the Lord had given to us. And when, when, they, when they were born and when they started to mature and they started to show characteristics of who they were, we understood fully that God named them based upon their characteristics and who he made them to be. There was a special characteristic and, and connotation to that name. And so we know those were God sent. But in the same way in the Bible, we see names are representative of either who the person is or who the person is going to be made out to be by God. And in, in one example is in Jacob. Everybody knows the story of Jacob. And how he wrestles with God. And many people think, well, he wrestled with God. How, how did he overpower God? But the, the point is, was God never was wrestling with Jacob to let Jacob, or even make him think that he was overpowering. God was wrestling with Jacob so Jacob could see that he would never overpower God. But he was still wrestling anyway. That was the point. He was still wrestling anyway. And through the wrestling match, God changes Jacob. And no longer is Jacob a deceiver, which that's what Jacob means, but Jacob now becomes Israel. He now is renamed by God. He said, since you have wrestled with God, since you have uh, endured with God, I'm going to rename you. And he renames him Israel. And that means literally wrestles with God. Or I like this, this better because in, in, in Hebrew, it also means triumphant with God. Not against God, but triumphant with God. So names means so much. We know when Jesus came to earth and Isaiah prophesies about Jesus, he doesn't call him Jesus, but he calls him a wonderful counselor, mighty God. He calls him Emmanuel, God with us. And that was a reference to who Jesus was going to be. And many times in Israel, they would have different names for people based upon their function and who they were. But the Holy Spirit is given specific names. And we need to understand these names because they define to us who he is and what his functions are. And we need to take a hold of this because we forget the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We think, you know, we've relegated the Holy Spirit to uh, say a couple of tongues, you know, jump on top of a, a chair and, and do all this stuff that kind of sounds crazy. But the Holy Spirit in his ministry, we have forgotten because he is the one that comes to us in the darkest times and he comforts us and sees us through. And we have the ability to rely on him and rely on his strength. But in John 16, 7, he's known as the comforter. I didn't put these up here, but John 16, 7, he's known as the comforter. John 16, 13, he's known as the spirit of truth who guides us into all truth. In John 14, 26, he's known as the teacher who brings to our remembrance everything that Jesus has said. And how many times have I been in those situations where I'm like, man, I can't remember a scripture to save my life. But then I get in a situation where I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to someone and all of a sudden the scripture comes to my mind and I'm, I'm reminded of what Jesus said in his word. And I use it as a, you know, the Holy Spirit uses it as a ministering tool because the word never goes void. But he brings to our minds things Jesus said. We have gotten in the habit of consulting ourselves and being quiet in our own thoughts. And that's a worldly philosophy. To be quiet in yourself, let's meditate. And I got a watch app, and I, I can't shut the stupid thing off, but it comes up and says, uh, be mindful today. But I, I don't want to be mindful. Can, can I change that to something else? I, I got to call Apple and ask them. Uh, it used to say meditate, and that, that scared me too. But so I, I, mean, I guess that's better, be mindful. But, you know, we, we got to quit consulting ourselves and our own thoughts. You know, your thoughts can be dangerous. And sometimes I don't want to know your thoughts, so don't throw them out there. <laughs> sometimes you don't want to know mine either. But, but we got to quit consulting our own thoughts, and we have to start consulting the Holy Spirit. Because he's the one who has all wisdom, all truth, and he's the one that can comfort us and, and calm us and give us peace. You know, like I said years ago, we used to spend hours in prayer until we heard from God. We would wait until we heard from God. I, we would wait, and we'd say, I'm not leaving until I receive a word from the Lord. We're like Jacob. We would wrestle with God for hours until we got our answer because things would get that serious in our lives where we needed an answer from God. You know, how serious is the, the problem? Well, it's as serious as you want to spend time in prayer. You know, and, and you will get an answer when you consult the comforter. You know, we've gotten so used to 
you know, drive-by prayers, you know, the, the quick, you know, drive-by and we're out of here. We got 30 seconds, let's pray, and okay, we're good to go. I said my, I said my requests and let's go, but there's a, an age coming and an age is here now where it takes more than that. You know, that we have to spend time with God, that we have to get to know God in prayer, that we have to besettle ourselves because so much is going on around us to distract, to take possession of our minds, and to steal our thoughts and our relationship that God wants to have with us. So we have to be intentional about that. And real prayer is a lost art, but we need it. And uh, we need to spend time in prayer. You know, a lot of people try to consult the TV. They try to consult the internet. And uh, it's, you know, funny years ago, 10, 12 years ago, I was so frustrated with myself and, and where life was going. And, you know, it, I, I felt like prayer was getting me nowhere. So I went to Google. And I asked Google, Google, what's going on? You know what I mean? And I literally I'll type stuff in. And what, do I, what do I get for a response? How do you, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm looking for a response on the internet. And, and you know, I, a thought came to me, you know, we're consulting a dead idol. You know, how many of us look up Google for answers today, you know? And, and, but we won't look up the Lord for true answers, you know? And it's almost like we're consulting the beast, you know, this, this false internet thing for all these answers when we have the answers that we need in Jesus Christ. And if we're saved and redeemed, then we are never alone. And that resource is always available to us. And you may feel alone, but it may be because you have been listening to the wrong voice. It may be you've been listening to the empty voice that never gives an answer. But when we are ready to stop and wait and petition God and say, God, I'm not leaving until I have the answer from you. And I have a peace and calmness that comes from your presence. I'm not leaving here. We have a, a treasure inside that we don't fully understand. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God and ye are not your own? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Your, your body is a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. And so you're not just your own. You're not responsible for just you but the holy spirit resides in you and whatever you do he does as well and think about that when you're getting ready to go sin you know and you're like oh you know, wait a minute you know i have someone dwelling with me and this person that's dwelling with me is perfectly holy and i'm taking him along for the ride you know it kind of changes your perspective of some things doesn't it dan's laughing i know why dan don't i'm just kidding Acts 2.38, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What a gift. You know, what a gift. You know, and, and when we've been Christians for a while, I think sometimes we forget just what a gift it is because it's become so ingrained in maybe who we are, and we've taken, you know, neglected it a little bit. But you remember when you were saved, you repented, and you felt something happen to you that was a cleansing and washing of the blood of Christ, but it was also an infilling of the Holy Spirit that changed you, changed your perspective, changed your mind, and you felt fresh, clean, and new because this Spirit came on you, and it was the Holy Spirit. And it came, came to reside in you. It is a gift that's given. Have you believed in Jesus Christ? Have you repented of your sin? And if you've never been baptized, then I encourage you to be baptized, but then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and it changes your life. It changes your perspective. And then you're His, and He is yours, and His presence is eternal, because He is a seal that's placed upon you that ensures your salvation of not just your spirit, which has happened, but your body too. It's consummated at the end time. It's an eternal thing. So his companionship is comfort. Think about the power that you have dwelling within you, but yet sometimes we refuse to consult the very one that's closest to us. His companionship is our comfort, and it brings comfort. The second thing is his companionship will change you, whether you want to be changed or not. His companionship will change you. And sometimes you, you run amok, you know, and you have those dark spells and, and you think, Lord, I just keep failing. I keep doing the wrong thing. And 
you take so much responsibility for what's going on in your life and your progress, but you don't understand that the Holy Spirit has been dwelling in you and He has initiated the progress from day one. And He's going to see it through to completion. Whether you go kicking or screaming and you scratch the wall, it really doesn't matter because He's going to make it happen some way, somehow. It just might be a little harder. But it will happen. Because He's dwelling in you. In Genesis 1, everyone knows Genesis 1. I remember being a kid in, in, in uh, preschool. I went to a Baptist school in preschool. And my mom wasn't Baptist, but she was, uh, she was deceived enough to put me in Baptist school. <laughs> because, because she wasn't really a, a believer. But she put me in this Baptist school, and I learned basics. And one of the first things we learned was Genesis 1. Unfortunately, she took me out in second grade, which I wish she wouldn't have. But in that, in preschool, I remember reading the story of creation. And how awesome the story was. And it kind of blew my mind even as a little kid, five and six years old. You know, wow. You know, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was... And even hearing those words as a little boy, you know, it, it kind of blows your mind. You know, the earth was void. There was nothing there. You know, you understood even then that this was a serious thing that was happening during creation. And God literally, He changes this nothingness into tangible somethingness. You know what I mean? There's a black void, and God speaks the black void into something. And that something is the earth, the sky, the living things, the water. Everything is created by the voice of God. And that same power that spoke everything into existence dwells in you and me, telling us to come and receive comfort, receive power, receive change, because He's the one that is bringing about the change. That same power can change you and I think sometimes we think we have more power than we do to hinder His work. And we get depressed and down because, Lord, look at what I've done. And, and we, we take stock of everything that we've done wrong, but we forget the power that is contained within Him to change us. And He's doing just that day by day. Day by day. He has power to accomplish what He set out to do in us. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, But we all... With open face, beholding, as in the glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Some people have reread that to say, I'm being changed from failure to failure, and, 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 but it doesn't work that way. It works from glory to glory to glory, because many times the failure that we see is the glory that God sees in us. And the very thing that He's wanting to accomplish, we think we failed at, He's accomplished something that has brought victory. If we were on the earth when Jesus died, we would have said, it's all over. Let's go home. We failed. He failed. We, that's what we would have saw. And so we saw the, 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 the culmination of what happened later. We would have said, you're, you're a failure, Lord. And many times we look at ourselves and we say, we're failures, Lord. But He looks at us and says, there's a sweet savor that I'm smelling coming from your failure because you just learned something. Yeah. And you've grown. The problem is sometimes we get so immersed in the world that we, we, we misunderstand what's happening. We get so immersed, and we are immersed in the world. And when we're immersed in the world and we are, we feel this conflict going on inside. Anybody have conflict inside? You ever feel conflict? And you wonder why. You know, why do I have this conflict? Why is there something going on? But the reason you have conflict is because you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and you live in a world that's not open and friendly to the Holy Spirit of God. As a matter of fact, it shuns Him and it wants to get rid of Him. And so you feel conflict in the world and the Spirit that dwells in you is at odds with the Spirit that dwells in the world. So don't take it as it's yourself as the reason why you feel the conflict. The reason why you're being bombarded because the reason why you're being bombarded is you are His and He dwells in you. If you weren't being bombarded, I'd say you're probably in trouble. I'd say you're probably needing to be saved and to start feeling the conflict. One of the functions of, of, of the Holy Spirit is to teach us according to God's righteousness. He doesn't teach us according to the world. He doesn't teach us according to the precepts of the world. He doesn't teach us according to the knowledge and experience of the world, but He teaches us according to His righteousness, and there's a big difference. There's a big difference. You know, there was a story about this little boy, and uh, he was a thief, little kid. 
And he would go and he would uh, he'd find it. He was like six years old. He'd go and he would find a, like a pickaxe. And he would take out the, uh, the, on the railroad tracks, he would take out the big spikes on the railroad track. And he would push the, the railroad ties out. And he'd go steal the railroad ties. And then he'd do this, you know, whenever he had the chance. And pretty soon the railroad became unstable because he'd stole the ties. And they knew about this little boy. And, and so one guy came along and he said, you know, I'm not happy that this kid keeps stealing railroad ties. He said, but he's resourceful. And he goes, I'm going to take him in. And I'm going to teach him. And I'm going to bring him up. <clears throat> and so he does. Brings up, sends him to college, you know, when he gets old enough. Kid goes to college and he's a genius, you know. He, he, he learns all about business, math. He's, he's genius. And the, the guy said, oh, there, there. I, I raised him up. He goes, he's no longer a kid that steals. And pretty soon the, the guy got famous and he ended up uh, being really successful in business. And they asked a lot of his friends, they said, you know, tell me about this, this kid, you know, and his sister. He goes, well, he was a thief when he was a little boy and he used to steal railroad ties. And when he got older, now he's a thief and he stole the whole railroad. <laughs> you know, you can get all the experience you want. You can get all the worldly knowledge you want. But if you're a thief when you're a little, you're going to be a thief when you get older unless you experience the, the salvation of Jesus Christ in your heart and your life. You can't resuscitate someone from evil. You can't resuscitate someone from bad habits, but they can be saved and be changed inside by the Holy Spirit. And that's what it requires. So when God calls us and brings us, He brings us into His righteousness from worldly unrighteousness, and that's the game changer in our lives. It's not that we need to be better people. We need to get educated. We need... All the, we need Salvation and changing by the Holy Spirit, and that's what the world needs. First Corinthians two twelve and thirteen it says, "Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual." You know, spiritual things with spiritual. There's, you know, apples and oranges here. And we need to put all our apples in one basket and understand God's teaching us in the apple basket, not in the orange basket. And there's a reason why they don't mix. But we allow the Holy Spirit to teach us. And the Holy Spirit's working to grow us up in the ways of God. And the process is His own. It's not worldly. You know, there, there's a, somebody once said, uh, they said, you know, there's, there's so many uh, people going into seminary today. But there's so many more dead churches than there's ever been. Something's disconnected. And the disconnection is the true salvation and change that comes from being saved and, and, and being immersed in the Holy Spirit. That's the difference. You can preach all day long. But if you don't preach from what God is speaking and the Holy Spirit, you might as well not preach at all. But He can change us. But the ways of God, the righteousness of God is in conflict with the ways of the world. But yet, we still try to find solace in the world. We've been called by Jesus Christ, saved to salvation, full of the Holy Spirit, and we go back to the world to find solace when the only one that really can give us solace is the Holy Spirit, God Himself. So it's no wonder why people feel lonely because they're not communing with the one who dwells in them. The Holy Spirit has a love for you and I. And the love He has for us is, is so deep. You know, it's, it's a deep love. It's a holy love. And the, world, the Word goes on. It says this in Ephesians 4.30. It says, To grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And, and I love that for two reasons. Number one, because it says, to Grieve not God, the Holy Spirit of God. And it says, You're sealed unto the day of redemption. It's almost like, you know, like... Uh, Two opposites. They're not two opposites, but two, I don't know what you want to call them. I'm not. Any English, English majors in here? All right, but anyway, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, but you're sealed under the day of redemption. So it is great to know that I'm sealed, but it hurts me to know that I can grieve God. You know, and, and the word grieve, it's interesting because when you're grieved, you know the hurt that comes with it. You know the pain that comes with it. You know the heartbreak that comes with it. You know when, when your child, you're, you're watching them grow up, and you see them make these mistakes and you see them fall and you see them hurt themselves and 
even though they may not know they're hurting themselves. And, and you dare not say too much because you don't want to be overbearing and you don't want to control, but yet you see what's going on and you're grieved in your heart. And the same way the Holy Spirit grieves. And I thought about this. You know, people hurt people, don't they? And we've all been hurt many times. And when you experience hurt from someone that you hardly know, it stings a little, you know? It stings a little. But when you're hurt by someone who you really know and you really love, it stings a whole lot. A whole lot. And though with the first person that you barely know, there's a little attachment maybe, but there isn't this huge emotional attachment. So the impact is, is much less. But when someone you love and you care for hurts you, it stings so much because you have equity in the relationship. You have invested something in the relationship. And so there is a grievance against that equity that you have put into the relationship. There's a history that has been betrayed. There's an emotion that has been betrayed. And there is a grief about what's been lost or disconnected. And so that hurt you experience is based on a deep love. And in the same way you have experienced that and you have realized that when relationships that have hurt you, we do the same thing to the Holy Spirit when we grieve Him. We hurt Him at His heart. And we don't think of God that way many times. We think of God more of, you know, the big, big guy in the sky, that type of thing. But He's the Holy Spirit that can grieve when we do something to Him, when we, when we hurt Him, when we do things that are contrary to what He is growing, on, growing us up to be. But thank God God is forgiving, you know. And, and when He brings us in as His own, we're His sons and daughters, and, and it'll never change, and that's what's so beautiful about it. Is though we grieve Him, though we hurt Him, we're still His sons and daughters, and He still strives with us and holds us and picks us back up the way a loving Father would, but He is a companion. And he loves you. And you never ever have to be lonely because he waits for you to turn to him. He waits for you to take consolation in him. He waits for you to come to him. The problem is many times we haven't come to him. And we haven't said, Lord, I just want to spend whatever it takes to just hear from you, to spend time with you. Lord, I'm going to cancel all my lunch dates. I'm going to cancel my, my dinner dates, Lord. I'm going to cancel my busy schedule. And I'm just going to spend five hours with you today. What would happen if we did that? And when's the last time we've done that? Probably never. But when we get to that point where we, we, we find in God the resource that we need and we understand that the, the very thing that's, that the world's trying to keep me away from is the very thing that would need and fulfill me and give me the strength I need to do the very thing God has assigned me to do that I, it seems impossible for me to do, then I'm going to say, Lord, I'm going to spend all the time I can with you and I'm going to cancel my appointments today just to pray, just to go to the one who can console me. And I'm going to stop being unconsolable and I'm going to start becoming consoled by the very Spirit of God. And then I'm going to see the strength that I have to go on day in and day out and to accomplish the thing you've accomplished me. But it's not about, it's not about accomplishing anything, but you can't accomplish anything without it. Many days I've gotten up and I've preached without praying first. And the sermons have been dead. There you ask Dan, you know. Sermons have been dead. And, you know, you don't, just don't have it because you're doing it yourself. But when you spend time with Him, you're consoled by Him, you receive of Him, He directs you and guides you, then you can do the very thing that you couldn't do otherwise. Where are you going for consolation? Are you going to him this morning? Or have you turned to other things? Let's stand this morning. Let's all close our eyes. If these words have hit you this morning. I'm glad. I'm glad that they have. I'm, I'm sad that we haven't turned to the Holy Spirit. But it's never too late. He's never unwilling. He never rebuffs us or rejects us when we come to Him, even in a late moment. And that's what's so beautiful about Him. But maybe you have taken consolation in the world. Maybe you have neglected the very love of your life. The source of your strength. You know, many people, when they get older, 
they may lose a loved one, they may lose a husband or wife. And, and the first thought, and we're dealing with this with our in-laws or my in-laws, is their first thought is, I need to go find someone else. But many times, God brings you to a place of aloneness, not to be lonely, but to spend time with Him. To foster a relationship with Him that you haven't done before. And he's not just calling the alone ones, but he's calling the ones who feel lonely. He's calling the ones that feel empty. And he's saying, my source and supply are waiting for you to come to me and wait. To come to me and plead. Because I dwell in you and I want to be your companion. I want to be your source of strength. I want to be the love of your life. I want to be the center of of everything that you do. And I never want you to be alone. Because I have provided myself to help you along every way. If you're feeling lonely this morning, <coughs> if you felt empty, then just ask Him to come in. Say, Lord, come into my heart. Father, make yourself new and fresh to me. Let me hear your voice again. If there's any sin holding you back and it's tormenting you, just lay that at his feet. And say, Lord, I repent. I'm laying this down. I don't want it anymore. Father, it grieves me and I know it grieves you. Just cleanse me and reestablish your fellowship with me, Lord. Walk with me. Talk with me. Father, I love you. Be refreshed this morning. Be renewed this morning. Be encouraged this morning. Be comforted this morning. And be changed this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can ask Him right now. Say, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Jesus Christ, I believe that you died and rose again on the third day. I believe that you sit on the right hand of the Father in heaven. And I confess my sin to you, Lord. And I ask you to forgive me. Father, send your Holy Spirit to live inside of me. And give me comfort. Lead me the rest of my life. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless.